Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton. Welcome to the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. When you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Was it a police officer? A firefighter? A hockey player? Those were some of the top jobs kids wanted when I was young. Today, in 2021, the number one job kids reported wanting to be was a YouTube star, followed by a Twitch streamer and various iterations of social media influencer, whether it's hawking merch on Instagram or trying to go viral with dance moves on TikTok. A whole generation of kids are coming up, raised and trained by the first generation of gamers, people like me and guys like today's guest, Shay Rucker. So what does that mean? And how is this going to change our culture? Let's just get into it. Shay, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks again for having me. How's it going? Good, good. Um, you know, kind of hold up here, but uh, as, as the reason why I'm here is because I, I play a lot of video games and I'm tuned into that. So it's not like there's much of a big change for me. <laughs> spend a lot of time indoors anyway i i do yeah maybe more than needed but I, I you know the cold's been really crappy i want to go for a run i want to get outside do a little bit of walking with the dog i feel that so we we're talking about in the very beginning of the show about what job you wanted as a little kid do you remember what you wanted to be when you were little Man, I had so many, um, a lot of creative stuff. I wanted to be a writer and then an artist, even though I really suck at drawing. Um, I remember, you know, you, you mentioned hockey player. I remember wanted to be a wide receiver because I, I really liked uh, Dan Farthing from the Riders and I wanted to be just like him. Uh, and then Jurassic Park came out and I wanted to be a paleontologist. So it was, it was kind of all over the place. I think that's interesting. Uh, I know that a lot of paleontologists now say that they came up because of Jurassic Park. A whole industry was revitalized. A whole field of study and thought was built on the fact that Steven Spielberg wanted to make a dinosaur movie. It wasn't uh, Ross from Friends being a role model and a paleontologist? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're really plugged into the esports scene, Twitch streamers, gamers. What are you seeing from young gamers today? Uh, a lot of young gamers, as you kind of touched on and, and talked about earlier, uh, they aren't necessarily tapped in for fun. What they see it as is a way, a path to success. Uh, they see all these people making a lot of money just playing games. And that's what they think they can do for a living is, you know, popping a game in, getting millions of views, raking in thousands and millions of dollars. So I, I, I'm seeing that kind of shift. What are the, the kind of dollar values that the top players are earning? Oh, man, it is. You know, as I was doing a little bit of research when you were asking about that because it's, it's all over the place. Um, so there's the professional level, which I'll kind of touch on a little more. Um, but then when you're talking about the grassroots level where 90% uh, of people who are making any sort of money on Twitch are making, and honestly, a lot of them are just scraping by. Some of them are doing design work or uh, work that would be a little bit of freelance stuff to make a little bit extra income. A lot of them have spouses that kind of help them out as well. Um, and we're talking a thousand to a couple thousand a year, um, barely enough to make rent in a lot of places. Um, but when you're talking about the professionals, um, so there's a few things that happen if you're talking strictly professional with esports a lot of them work for teams you know that sign them on and they have a signing salary usually averages between 2500 to 6000 american per month or per year per month yeah and and that's at the at the, at the top level uh, if you have guys that are signed um remotely or on backup rosters or just as trials uh sometimes they just get a little bit of a signing bonus uh sometimes there's a small salary um but yeah, that's, that's usually kind of the, the start to it. So let's talk a little bit about the formation of teams. How did teams come about when it comes to video games? Uh, teams come about by investors, you know, much like sports teams saying, I want to buy a team and make some money off the team. So uh, they would invest their own money, capital in it uh, to create an infrastructure for these teams and hopefully have them earn 
uh, money from winnings, uh, but more so sponsorships. There's a lot more sponsorships that are involved in you know, actually bringing in a sustainable income for everyone. So there's a person that brings together a team, floats them a bunch of cash, and then takes a cut from the sponsorships or takes all of the sponsorship money? Uh, usually what happens is they take all the sponsorships. They might have bonuses um, and sponsorships that uh, would tie into individual players. So if you have a jersey, um, you purchase a jersey, you get a cut of that if it has your name on the back. Or um, bonuses for uh, coaching or for getting your team to the finals, even though you might not necessarily play. Um, and I actually have some figures here for the uh, top esports team, uh, the most successful esports team. So uh, across all of the winnings, this is Team Liquid, and they've been prolific for about 10 years in the scene. I'm sure you know Liquid from StarCraft. And then they they actually branched off into other games. So the, the top four earning games, they're not even StarCraft. The top one is Dota, and they've won several internationals, which is the very high-grossing prize pool, uh, one of the biggest gaming tournaments in sports. Uh, and uh, so they've earned a little under $23 million for the whole team. Now, if you tally up all of their earnings, that is a little under 30 to $35 million. Uh, and that's spread across eight, 1,837 tournaments. So you're looking at an average earning for the entire team, the entire organization of 16000 per tournament, which when you have 100 employees and 100 people on your roster, that stretches out very thin. Right. That doesn't sound like a lot of money. It doesn't, uh, but it that's where the- starts at $35 million. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's where the sponsorships come in. Is is it growing? Is this sustainable, or is it kind of collapsing under its own weight? Is it is it a kind of a churn uh, for the owners and for the uh, esports industries themselves? It's growing at an exponential rate. Uh, for the players, th- there's a lot of opportunity there, and there's more teams, and there's more uh, available options for them to compete. Um, however, it's not like a more established sports league where they have X many teams that are always going to be there. Or even, you know, you look at the English uh, soccer leagues and they have relegated teams and uh, dozens and dozens of hundreds of teams going across all the leagues. Uh, Maybe not hundreds, sorry. (laughs) But uh, all of these chances to play at multiple levels, whereas there's only so many slots available, um, especially once you're getting into tournaments. League structure isn't a huge thing. I know that there's this tendency within esports to kind of have that Michael Jordan effect where one person really kind of leaps out and can represent or become the face of a game. Uh, personally, I'm aware of Ninja as kind of one of the big representatives for Fortnite, but who's really big right now? Who are a lot of people watching? Um, see, the, the issue is a lot of those players aren't people that you're going to necessarily know. Uh, you get these rock stars that are on teams and, uh, they could be really good at their specific role and they could have a following. But when you're talking about the wider audience, you're not going to have a Michael Jordan that has a huge, uh, following. Now, the interesting thing about Ninja, and I actually have some stats about him too, because he's actually fallen from grace in a way. The dude's still raking in a ton of money and he's got all that sponsorship from going over to Mixer. Um, But people don't really understand that he was never a pro player. He was a professional Halo player who then went to Fortnite and was a good player, but not a tournament player, not the best of the best. Um, You got, but he had personality. Personality goes a long way. He had personality, which is like, you know, so, so that's where, you know, when I talk to a lot of companies, Every single time they think about Twitch streaming, they're like, oh, well, it's like watching, you know, a, f- a football game or it's like watching hockey. It's like, well, no, no, no. It's more like a talk show. Um, more of the people making the money are coming from streaming, being personalities. Uh, and really, that's low stress for those players as well. Why is it lower stress? Because they, so Shroud, for instance, is one of the more prolific uh, players in multiple uh, FPSs he's competed in that and he retired from FPSs just to go play casually with his friends he doesn't have to practice uh, 12 to 14 hours a day he doesn't have uh, even team-based sports the pressure of performing and pulling off those clutch maneuvers Um, he can just go play games and get the streaming income 
So what do you tell young gamers who say to you, oh, I want to go compete or I want to be a professional streamer? What is your first instinct? See, it's weird because I was a kid who wanted to play guitar and you know be a rock star and all that things. I don't want to break their hearts, but I usually end up having to. Um, I have parents reach out and say, hey, my kid wants to be a streamer. How does that work? And that's a difficult conversation to approach because often it doesn't work. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily me being pessimistic or realistic. Uh, much like people who are playing hockey, it's a fraction of a percent that actually make it to the NHL. Right. So you, you got to break their hearts. Uh, how exceptional is it to break out and not just be another uh, also ran? Extremely exceptional. When you talk about the skill set that's involved, uh, you look at the whole concept of esports. You're good at what you're doing. You're competing. To be on that high, high level, that takes an extreme amount of dedication, an extreme amount of luck, uh, getting noticed in certain situations, and consistency. Uh, I remember way back when I was first on the podcast, we talked about the oldest age you can be to compete in StarCraft is 25. And that's because there's so much involved that you just degrade over time, even at a young age like that. The the fast twitch muscle memory can't keep up with uh, the demands of playing the game. Yeah. And, and um, you know, one of the things I looked up here is uh, one of the larger games on Twitch right now is chess. And it's something that people are playing, but not necessarily grandmasters or very high levels at, um, because a lot of the larger streamers picked it up, started playing it, had fun with it. Um, and the thing about chess is you need to study hundreds of years of chess moves. You can't just go in and be really good at chess. And it's the same way when you're talking about strategy games. Uh, you have a lot of these games with dozens of characters with hundreds of different moves and items that you have to learn and strategies and counterplays. And there's a lot more studying that is involved in that. And it's a, it's a team collaboration. That's why you have coaches, uh, you know, whether it's coaches behind the scenes or coaches that actually come to tournaments and help you out. There's a lot of work involved. I remember seeing that with certain card games, uh, things like magic, they would say that it could get to a solved state where players would optimize their decks or their collections in such a way that there was no better way to win than the the skill and the luck combined in that zone. So what kept magic being relevant or fresh was all these new cards, all these new rules constantly changing, but within the parameters of the game. So people could keep going back to it. And I see that happening with games like Dota or heart of the swarm where they keep introducing new characters or new maps. So the players have something new to, to chew on, uh, to take it back to your chess analogy. My understanding was that chess is a solved game. Like computers have figured out chess. It, there is a finite number of correct answers and most optimal plays and computers have figured this out. The human mind doesn't necessarily grasp it or get there. And that's what makes it interesting to us. But there is an end to chess. Like it has been solved. Like Connect Four. There's there's a perfect way to play Connect Four where you'll never ever lose, because it is a solved game. And they say computers have solved chess, and I see that happening with video games where players solve the current state. Yeah, you know that's a good point. And what ends up happening is you have games falling from. Uh, you know, the top spots, uh, Fortnite, for instance, uh, if you look at the top 50 uh, streamers on Twitch for most watched hours last month, uh, three out of those are Fortnite. And Fortnite was a huge game a year ago. Uh, and there's always going to be these cycled in games that come and go. Um, there's a couple of mainstays that have always been there. League of Legends is always on top. Uh, Dota is not necessarily on top, but it's very popular. And Counter-Strike Go. Those are the big competitive games that will probably remain until they make new iterations of those. What what makes Counter-Strike so enduring? Well, when you talk about the Magic the Gathering slash chess, um, that is entirely a mind-focused game. Uh, you can strategize you could prepare but there's not the individual physical twitch movements there's not that 
unreliable uh, um, part of it that could just pop up. You know, you can't have clutch plays, you can't have anything. It's all based on luck, whereas you need that physical part of it to perform well in these other games. Okay. One of the things I've been noticing is my little guy, he picked up Fortnite, and I would get to watch him play and then play alongside him on his team. And it was kind of funny because uh, very early on in the first couple of weeks, he would just run straight at the target and just shoot at them. And there was no dodging, no strafing. He wasn't jumping or trying to deke them out or fake them out of their shorts. And so I would say to him, buddy, you got to, you got to dodge the incoming bullets. You can't just run straight into their shotgun or you're, you're just dead. <laughs> And very quickly over the course of like three weeks, he's, he's now strafing, he's jumping, he's, he's, oh, I got to get on top of the house and be on high ground because it's safer than, than being on the ground where they can, uh, shoot me easier. And I, I explained to him concepts like hitbox and range, uh, versus, uh, like there's different ways to have projectiles moving through the air in video games versus a hitbox where it just registers that you hit that zone, you get the hit. And uh, he, it doesn't fully register with him, but you can see the glimmer is like twinkling. <laughs> it's like I've had 25 years to grind it out in, in shooters and video games. So I can give him these little tips and uh, I watch him playing with his buddies and suddenly he's, leapfrogging in terms of skill it's it's fun to watch well it's it's wisdom that you've picked up over the years starting from playing quake or unreal tournament and all of that stuff does end up applying further and further and that's kind of the difference between sports um a really good soccer player might not be very good at baseball uh they could run to the plate but when it comes to the hand-eye coordination it's very different skill sets uh and it's it's I'm really glad that your your kid is having a lot of fun with the game. He's getting better at it and um, enjoying winning and getting better at the game. However, a lot of people don't realize that there is so much grinding personally that is involved with getting better to the point where you know, like a lot of kids say, I have fun playing video games. If you get to the point where you're playing 14, 15 hours a day, you're not going to have fun that whole time. Yeah, it becomes more like work. Yeah, and and that's what kids don't really realize. Ah, I'm just going to play games and have fun. Well, you got to edit the videos and uh, you got to come up with new different things. And there's always the stress of how you're performing in your videos. Um, and that's not even counting the professional side of things and being able to perform and not choke. That kind of sounds like how uh, the YouTube kids, they have one video go viral, it goes crazy, and then their next 10 videos do nothing. So then they decide, well, I've got to be crazy or zany or push it to the top, be jumping off buildings and going gonzo just to try and get those eyeballs back. Absolutely. Is that what's happening with video game guys too? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, when I talk to uh, a lot of kids, uh, success is fleeting where you could have a fly by night, awesome video go over overnight. Um, but unless you have a combination of hard work and luck, that's very tough to to continue on with. <laughs> I think maybe it's the the benefit of not being very invested, but my very first TikTok that I uploaded got four views, did nothing, went nowhere. And then I uploaded one uh, last week and it got 500. I have no idea why. <laughs> I, uh, with my company, Marsh Digital, um, we do digital marketing consultants and social media is always a, a really weird thing because when people bring us on, uh, a lot of times they want to go viral. I let them know that that's not necessarily the case. What we can do is we can help you create content to deliver on specific goals. Um, and if you, if you go in looking for the, the top tier of success, uh, you're going to fail most, most of the time. <laughs> I try to tell people aim for talking to your audience and going viral will, will come second. Like it will naturally flow from the, the fact that you identified your audience and you talked to them meaningfully. And I've given you guys praise before and lauded what you do with your social media in terms of rebellion. Uh, and I think you guys are doing awesome. Uh, and that's because you, you look at it as reaching your audience instead of trying to sell beer. <laughs> Thanks man. There's always that aspect of selling beer, but uh, you guys always kill it. 
whether it's having the owner be involved in that stuff or adding all of those personal touches. In terms of uh, delivering what the audience wants or maybe selling a little beer, let's drink today's beer. Sure. So today we've got Multinationals Classic Pilsner, 5% ABV. Oh. I've already poured mine. I got mine in a nice glass because you gave me guff about that before. <laughs> yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> When you're a beer geek, glassware matters. Absolutely. Um, and I have noticed that since I've started pouring into glasses, you get a very different flavor. Um, and I prefer it more. Really? Yeah. Like you have a specific glass or a favorite glass you like to pour your beer into? Oh, just glasses in general. Um, you know, as, as you can see right here, we, we got on webcam right now, but um, got a pint glass. And I think I've had these, I got them for Christmas like eight years ago and I still use them. When I was looking online, there's not a lot of verbiage about multinationals beers. They kind of push people to their social media channels and a lot of the content is fleeting. But what I could find was they wanted to say the beer is crushable. And clearly through the name they're saying it's a it's a classic throwback. It should remind you of that classic Pilsner style. Well, it doesn't necessarily remind me of the classic Pilsner style because I like the flavor of this. <laughs> when I think Pilsner, I think actual Pilsner, and I think not having anything except for Molson Canadian. I'm sorry, can I can I harp on them a little bit? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. So so old beers like that before I realized what good beer is, and uh, so that doesn't remind me of this at all. This is awesome. Well, I think there is a important distinction between the Molson AB InBev kind of stuff where they, they call it Pilsner and there's the Pilsner zone at the, at the Ryder stadium versus a Czech Pils or a classic small P Pilsner style beer, which features the Saz hops and you know, the, that kind of crackery flavor that cr I just crisp is kind of one of the words I think of. Crisp is a good word. I, I like the, the sweetness of it. You think it's sweet? And that's something that you often don't get. Well, it, it's got a it's got a little bit of a sweetness, and I know my my palate's a, a little odd, but I, I I definitely feel, and maybe it's lightness, maybe it's a little mixture of everything, but that's kind of what I'm getting out of that. Not necessarily like a honey sweet, as you know, uh, sometimes there is a lot in uh, some more recent craft beer. Fair enough, I, but when I think pilsner, I don't necessarily think. <laughs> Uh, usually when I thought of Pilsner back in the day, I just thought it tasted like nickels, like bloody gross <laughs> nickels. And I never liked it. So I was really, uh, put off by the style. And anytime anyone was like, oh, let's have a Pilsner. I'd be like, man, eh, no thanks. And it took me a long time to wrap my head around the more traditional classic style pills or craft pills because it was so emotionally connected to those negative excuse me, those negative experiences of having a really awful Pilsner. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have the same thing with vodka, you know, way too many bad situations of vodka or starting to drink. And that's kind of what you have available. And uh, if it makes you sick, it makes you sick. But I, I really like what Malty does um, in terms of very small runs of their beer. Am I correct in that? Yeah, they do uh, pretty small runs. I think they basically sell every drop. I haven't heard of them having a problem with a glut of of uh, beer. It's a very loyal, dedicated audience that they've cultivated. And, um, you know, I think my only complaint so far about this beer was a little bit of the sticker shock. I'm kind of more, was expecting a, a 15 to $16 price range, and I think I paid about $22 for the four-pack. And I would say that might be my biggest complaint about the beer. It's nice. It's crisp, easy drinking. If you if you want a little bit more uh, aggressive flavor compared to something that's a little bit lighter, like, uh, for example, our lentil or the cerveza, I think a Pilsner is something you might want to look at. Mm -hmm. I, I drink a lot of your cerveza. Um, that's one of my favorite lights that you guys have. Um you know, and, and talking about the, the low production run of this and going back to almost the YouTube channel, 
it, it, it must be really difficult to kind of come up with something fresh all the time, um, which is really cool. And, and I appreciate that. We've been talking about that um, kind of within the, in the broader community. It's, it's like, where do you go next? And when does the next wacky flavor stop being considered beer? <laughs> you know, I'm like if it doesn't taste like beer, but it tastes like donuts, is it still beer? What makes a beer a beer? <laughs> I, I, I always kind of feel bad. And uh, this is the beer snob maybe coming out of me, but I usually always just pick up sours from you guys. Um, I'll, I'll always try the new beers that come out, but you, you just kill it in the sour so much. And is, is that necessarily a beer? Yeah. All beer was traditionally a sour way back in the day before they broadly understood what was going on scientifically with the product. You had a, a soured beer. Just that's what happened. Interesting. Well, I, I, I love it. And, and this is quite awesome too. So sours are what you're personally drawn to? Usually. Yeah. Um, and not because I had a predisposed, uh, attraction to sours or predisposed like of sours uh but mostly just the the stuff that you guys have brought on have really turned me on to that whole thing um and it's like trying to find a good red beer uh, i can never find a good red beer because nobody's making same with sours right i can't go to the lb and pick up sours other than the stuff that you guys always make i think it's really interesting that you've kind of found that for yourself that you've you've turned on to the sour style, even though you didn't start there, and it kind of makes me reminds me of this thought that we've been sharing over the last couple of weeks, which is we make a whole bunch of different beers and wacky different styles. You got your nice easy drinkers, and then you got your sours and your big hazies and your IPAs. We don't expect you to like everything, but we hope that you can find something to love, and. That's our goal. And if sours are the ones you, you love, then everybody wins. And you know me, I I try every beer that you guys have. Um, oh, well, thank you. As much as I possibly can. And there's always new and exciting things that are coming out. And uh, especially when there's a sour, I usually get pinged by you guys saying, hey, new sour, come check it out right away. And I'm like, yep, send me a flat. <laughs> Shay's name is on that sour. <laughs> yep. You know, I will say, I think I've been spoiled by other Pilsners. When it comes to multinational, I think I I enjoy this one, but I I like their IPAs even more. And I think next time I go back to multi, I'm going to have to go back to their IPAs. I just want that more. I, I don't traditionally drink IPAs anymore. What I've always enjoyed at uh multi when they have it is as i really like their stouts i really like the the full-bodied uh type of beer that has just you know almost chewable uh <laughs> really? It, it's really thick and it's got a lot of flavors to try to circumnavigate and and th th those are my favorites from multi you're a little bit of a stout guy right i i do tend to like stout more than ipa um just the richness i guess cool <laughs> I think stouts were basically all I drank for a period of two years. It's all I wanted. And I didn't really get off the stout train until maybe a year ago. Yeah. I don't, I don't miss stouts. I still enjoy it from time to time, but I find that I'd rather be chasing down a IPA or hazy or a, maybe a session IPA. Yeah. I think like a lot of blondes for me um, are, are what I traditionally drank before, uh, you know, uh, IPAs, blondes, uh, any kind of light beers. And then stouts would be a treat. There wasn't <laughs> a lot available for us. And then now sours, cause it, it's, it's a relatively new thing for me. Relatively new for Saskatchewan too. Um, one of the things that's really interesting we noticed uh, with sours is how quickly people are picking up on it. If you look at the Venn diagrams of who's drinking what beers, it kind of breaks into three categories, sours, IPAs, and then your, your lighter offerings. And then there's a smattering of crossover in between with those other styles. But those are the big three categories. People dig those IPAs. They dig the sours. They're really loyal to that kind of like flavor. And I, I find that super interesting. Sorry, that wasn't a question. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's uh, I love hearing your insight on that all the time. 
let's get back to gaming for a little bit. Sure. Uh, we talked a lot about how difficult it is to kind of break out and how hard it is to kind of cross that gap and where fun becomes work. Is there someone who's a cautionary tale or someone you would point to and say, look, kid, hit the books and worry about games later because this person. The uh, I, I tried to look this up when you sent me the the notes, and there's not really a lot of high profile ones that had fallen. Um, there's been a lot of people that have been canceled for other reasons than uh, gaming, and I don't necessarily want to touch on that right here today. Um, but politically charged comments, would you say? Politically charged, or um, even more negative comments that uh, are a little deplorable. Um, <laughs> deplorable. I, it's deplorable. I, I feel like the only thing that happens is um, you get a lot of these guys who become hype beasts, which are the ones that have all this money and they make videos about how rich they are and how many cars they buy. Um, and quite often they can spiral out of control. Like you're talking, jumping off of buildings and uh, doing all that stuff. And, and most of it is uh, in relation to getting in trouble with the law. Um, but the unfortunate thing is that only ends up making them more popular because <laughs> people want to watch and see the train wreck they love the train wreck and then they they have a, a good enough team behind them to capitalize on that train wreck it's the same as you got these tmz articles and um having all this crazy stuff come out and uh robert downey uh has his fall from grace and then becomes the biggest movie star for for his period right I kind of wanted to shout at you. Hashtag world star. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, you know, world star just became more prolific with, <laughs> with uh, what's there. And, and all these people are doing their own individual world star. I feel like TikTok is the new world star, except instead yeah. of paparazzi, it's people putting the cameras on themselves. Kind of like the Capitol riots where you had all these guys live streaming them committing crimes. I'm like, what are you, what are you guys doing? <laughs> like, that's on the internet now forever. <laughs> well, and, and if you look at uh, TikTok and Instagram, I guess this is a good uh, cautionary tale. Um, the amount of those people that can take themselves off that platform and do something different is, is a lot smaller than the, the gaming community that can harvest a much better community that kind of comes around them in a wholesome manner. Um, and we'll continue to watch them for more than just look how beautiful I am or how rich or, uh, it's more hanging out with a friend than seeing someone you idolize. You said something interesting there. I want to circle back on. You're saying that video games are more wholesome than Instagram and TikTok. The communities around video games are going to be more wholesome. Um, uh, you're not going to have all these stands that come out and have this toxic, uh, obsession, with the people that they're following there's always going to be those people uh, but for the most part uh, the thing i always try to establish whenever i talk to companies because they're the ones that don't necessarily understand about twitch is that it is like hanging out with your friends and when you're in that kind of situation that is more of a friendly type of interaction who's doing it right who's doing it right uh in terms of like getting good quality interaction with everyone. Yeah. Who's healthy. Who's popular. Who's not being a total weirdo. I, I think, uh, this is, I, I love this kind of stories, uh, PewDiePie and Jack Septiguy and a lot of those old hats from YouTube. They're a lot older now. Um, they're a lot less screamy into the mic. I can't watch any of their old stuff. Uh, but they have a very wholesome way of engaging with their audience. And I think they're actually really good role models, despite, especially PewDiePie having all of the controversy that he's had over the last little bit. He's used that to, uh, donate to several charities. He's used that as a platform to explain to a lot of his impressional viewers. Yeah, this isn't right. I, I have remorse for things like that. Um, and they're at a point in their careers where they're not trying to make money and they recognize the platform that they have and they're trying to do something a little good and, and they're trying to steer their audience in a better place. I think there is a certain amount of insight to be gleaned from surviving and learning from your own mistakes. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and it's, it's really easy in cancel culture. You, you don't get to exist anymore because you offended the the current shibboleth of the day. 
Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you if you try your hardest just to be a good person, uh, I think that mitigates any or most of the chances you have at uh, cancel culture. Um, it, it will still happen, especially if you're in the public spotlight. But uh, the the thing I look about these guys or at, at these guys for is they're the same age as me. And I was stupid as a kid. I made lots of stupid mistakes. And even as a young adult, and you grow from that and given the opportunity to grow from that is the, the biggest blessing that we can ever get. One of the things I wanted to kind of poke upon or finish upon was I was talking to another parent and they were saying, oh, my, my child wants to be a streamer. What does that take? And so I kind of touch upon like, well, they need a good camera. They need good lighting. They, they need to be relatively proficient at the, the game or the content they're producing. But what the real takeaway is, is they're learning how to be personable and friendly and manage an audience. They're doing voice work. They're learning the technical skills that they can take forward when it, whether it's video or audio editing or uh, crisis management, when something goes wrong, they, they're, uh, they're learning without realizing they're learning. You know, when I had to strip down a computer and figure out how to run a LAN so I could play Starcraft with my friends when the internet wasn't working properly, I learned a lot. When I had to build a computer by hand with my friends just so we could play video games to get, because that new graphics card just came out that could actually play the game that I wanted, I learned a lot. And at the time, it didn't feel like learning. It was just, well, I want to play video games, so this is what I got to do. <laughs> so I tried to relate that story to the parent, and they were like, yeah, it's not so much about whether the kid will get famous. It's what does the kid learn along the way, and then how can they take that forward? If you want to start streaming at a very high quality, you need a, a great internet, uh, a landline directly run into your computer, um, and the amount of investment that you have to do is sometimes up to $10,000. But if a kid really wants to learn how to do stuff like this, it's a good investment to get them Photoshop or get them Adobe After Effects and have them just mess around, you know, have, uh, splice some music in and try to get some gameplay footage and put it into a video. And if you look at that as something to have a creative outlet with, that's going to be very beneficial for the kid. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks for your time today. Oh, thanks for having me again, man. I'm always willing to come here and geek out and have some beer. Deadly. Rebels, thanks for listening today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, The Rebellion Brewing Podcast. I'm going to include links in the show notes so you can find Shay online and check out all the cool stuff he's doing. I'm also proud to let you know that we're members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. It's a one-stop shop for tons of locally produced shows from across our province. You can find them at the saskpodcastnetwork.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on the latest in Sascraft beer news. Thank you for joining the rebellion.